fascination. Um, it's not exactly the same as teaching a human being. So I'm learning quite a bit about how to teach machines, which is fascinating. Um, and especially as a geek, you know, because you speak to machines better than you speak to humans, but I'm not sure that's true. Um, anyway, enough of me rambling on. We're going to uh, hear a little bit about open source R, uh, which in Singapore we pronounce as R, which is a sort of slangy way of saying R. But then, you know, it's a single letter, it stands on its own. It's a little hard to pronounce, but it you know, communicates. Um, we have uh, Dr. Graham Williams from Microsoft, and uh, he's a data scientist, I think, would be safe to say. Um, but in addition, he's got um, like three decades worth of experience in this area, and he's written a number of books uh, to deal with uh, data science and statistical uh, things that relate to R, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let's hear from Dr. Williams. Great, thank you very much. How's that volume? It sounds rather loud. Hopefully it's okay. So thank you and welcome, and um, thank you for joining us this afternoon and um, um, for sticking around. I want to do three things this afternoon, and we've got a pretty short time in which to do it. Um, I do want to encourage you, if you've got your computer in front of you, um, feel free to load up R if you don't already have R on your computer, and um, even load up the um, uh, rattle. If you've got a Windows machine, um, or a uh, Linux machine, or a Mac, then the suggestion is to go to the appropriate website, um, which if you go to togaware.com, if I have spelled that right without getting caps lock stuck on, you'll find there some uh, uh, instructions on installing R and uh, eventually Rattle. And I'm not always sure we're getting network connection here. Um, Togoware.com, anyhow. Uh, feel free to have a look at that. Three things I want to do. I want to give a bit of a, a, um, uh, a view on AI and machine learning, and in particular, decision trees, ensembles, and a bit of a theme of um, everything that we do in machine learning is around ensembles. Um, then I want to quickly look at open source R and the suite of tools that we have available in open source R that support machine learning. All the machine learning algorithms, or most of the machine learning algorithms that we have available, are available in R. Um, even if they're implemented in other packages, such as Weka, Weka being a more popular Java based machine learning framework for the computer science side of the world, all of those tools are also available within R, um, as well as um, TensorFlow, as we've seen, uh, next year, a whole suite of, um, suite of algorithms. And I'll give a quick demo of um, using those algorithms um, quickly in R. And I'll finish with the issue that we have with R around essentially elastic data science. As we know, data science is about analyzing very large collections of data. R, like many machine learning algorithms, are, is memory based. How do we get over that major and significant hurdle? And I'll um, introduce a couple of things around that. So I want to start off with machine learning. Now, I wasn't quite sure what, who the audience was going to be here. And we're in an open source conference. The major theme of the conference is machine learning and AI. Um, who knows what a decision tree induction algorithm is? OK. In a way, I'm pleased to see it's only a small number. Um, so I hope I don't uh, bore the small number uh, too much. But I wanted to kind of convey um, that we often look at machine learning and AI in general and think about it being a bit of a, a, a mystery. It works magic. We don't really understand what's happening. And I was curious yesterday, um, I'm not sure if Andrew is in the room, but Andrew from Google in the panel yesterday made a similar kind of comment that you know when he learned um, compiler construction and implemented his first compiler, suddenly the magic 
of taking a program and converting it magically in some way into something that the computer would run, it turned into reality and he understood what was going on. And often we hear people dismiss or not um, delve into getting an understanding of what is actually happening in machine learning and AI. And in fact, we often imagine that there's quite significant depth in the algorithms that we're running. And yet, they can be explained quite simply. Neural networks, the basis of deep learning, have been around since the 1950s. And we characterise our current era in computer science or in machine learning as an era where the compute power that's available to us and the amount of data, the sheer amount of data that we have available to us today is just the right time for neural network technology to really advance significantly. That we, to do things as we've seen today with um, CNTK, earlier on this morning with TensorFlow, um, the types of analyses that we can do, translating um, Skype um, from one language to another live as you are communicating with somebody, the live um, uh, demonstrations that we saw of the videos, identifying objects and images and tracking those objects and images, is all now possible because of the massive amount of compute power and data that we have available. But machine learning algorithms have been around for a very long time. I've been in the space of machine learning um, since the 1980s when I was doing my PhD. Um, the algorithms, and indeed the algorithm, the primary algorithm for machine learning that we used at that time was something called decision trees. And whilst today we talk a lot about deep learning algorithms, the whole suite of other machine learning algorithms that we have available to us are still very, very important in business. Deep learning algorithms are fantastic where you've got a massive amount of numeric oriented data, work exceptionally well with images, audio and so on. But there's so much opportunity still for the whole suite of machine learning algorithms. I wanted to give a very quick introduction to what a decision tree induction algorithm is. The most widely used machine learning algorithm in the world today is still the decision tree induction algorithm. And one of the key things about this algorithm is that it gives you knowledge. Being an AI researcher from the, from the 1980s, our focus has often been around extracting knowledge from the analysis of data. And it's very difficult to extract knowledge from very deep neural networks, but a decision tree and other algorithms give us insight into, into knowledge. Like all machine learning algorithms, three particular characteristics um, from an AI perspective, there's how do we represent knowledge? How do we search through the space of all possible models that we might build? And how do we measure the goodness of a model once we have built it? How do we use heuristics to work through that search base to find the model that best matches the data that we have available? Every machine learning algorithm is essentially doing that, searching through a massive space to build a sentence in a particular language that represents in some form the data. It's a model. Decision tree induction is, is quite a simple example of building a model from data. Um, it can be described really easily. Let's have a look at the room in front of us here. And I'm going to make some assumptions. It's not quite true, but let's say half the people in the room are wearing glasses. Actually, it's probably not about, um, it's probably about right. About half the people wearing glasses, half are not. One of the characteristics looking at the room here of the people wearing glasses versus the people not wearing glasses. And these characteristics that I'm going to invent don't necessarily reflect reality, but let, let's imagine they did. Now, if half the people in the room were wearing glasses and half weren't, the next person who walks in through the door, what would be our guess as to whether or not, scared them off the bit, what's our guess as to whether or not they would be wearing glasses? Based on my model that I have from the people in front of me here, 50-50, I, I, I don't really know. It, it's a random guess almost, because based on the population here, 
50-50. Um, if two people walk in the door, maybe one will, one won't. Okay, let's now split the room into two. And just for simplicity, let's say I split the room, um, all the females here, males over here. And then I had all the males here. And I looked at the percentage of people wearing glasses amongst the males. And making up a number, let's say it was 20% um, of males were wearing glasses. Over here, maybe it's 80% of females are wearing glasses. Next person walks in the door, what do you think I might do to try and predict whether or not they are wearing glasses? Okay, I'll test gender, are they male? I'll make a guess with 20% accuracy that they won't be wearing glasses. I'll, if it's female. <laughs> so I should have done my figures around the other way, hey? <laughs> Interesting point, any model we build will always or, or will never be accurate unless we had perfect data, who has perfect data. But it's an approximation of the real world. Now, maybe 80, maybe it was 70 or 60% of women wore glasses. I might look for another characteristic now to partition the females into two groups, maybe tall and short. Tall females, again, just randomly picking these. Um, tall females, 80% likelihood of wearing glasses. Short females have a 20% likelihood of wearing glasses. Hence, next person walks in the door, if they're female, we'll then also check whether they are tall or short and then make our decision based on that. And that model that I've built, it's, you can kind of get a sense, it, it, it's a decision tree. It's a tree kind of in that structure that we've got up there. Um, that's the language that we're expressing the model, and that's a model that I can now use to make decisions for me. It's never going to be accurate, but it's going to be pretty accurate. We can sometimes get um, good accuracy, usable accuracy from these models. Now that's one, one decision tree. These are used widely um, when you apply for a loan at the bank. They are using these kinds of models to decide whether to give you that loan or not. They're predicting whether you're going to commit, uh, whether you're going to default on your loan. Or they're looking at transactions using models like this to predict whether they're going to be fraudulent transactions or not. Based on that quite simple algorithm. Now underneath there, there is some more complex mathematics and, um, underpinning what's happening there. But at a high level, that's as simple as we get in terms of using machine learning to build models of the world. Now, the, in the early days, we only built one model. We aimed to build the very, very best model at any particular time. We soon came to realise that at any particular time, maybe it's not gender, um, Boy, that model's not working well at all. <laughs> um, obviously, males are much more uh, dominant. I've got an 80% uh, uh, accuracy just walking through the door. So, um, but it's all based on what I'm observing here. Maybe this is room's not representative of people who are out there and so on. But building the one best model, we soon found wasn't the best way to go. And in fact, when you have a group of people together, each of them have their different views on, on um, the sorts of things to look at. Maybe gender wasn't the best thing to choose. Maybe it was age. Maybe there's some physiological aspect of that as well. So we should look at age early on. So maybe we have another model that looks at age first, and then another model that looks at shirt colour, shoe size, whatever. So we might have an ensemble of models we started discovering that we were getting better models. And so one thing to remember about everything that, I, I think that everything that we're doing in, in machine learning these days is that it's all about ensembles. It's all about a collection of entities working together in some form or other. I can see some smiles. <laughs> Gee, that's almost 100% accurate that males are wearing glasses um, coming into the room. Wow. Um, 
So ensembles are the basis of um, uh, many of the models today. In fact, the best, um, some of the best modelling um, algorithms used in, uh, yes, um, pretty good accuracy if we had it the other way. Uh, well, <laughs> no exceptions to the rule yet. Um, so, um, ensembles, um, XG Boost, the most popular algorithm on the Kaggle competition site at the moment. Um, um, available in our open source software, um, older versions of uh, Boosting, Ada Boost, Random Forest, and so on. Ensembles are, are the key. So we've got a whole suite out there of algorithms available um, to us. And I'm a computer scientist um, coming out of um, um, AI research, machine learning, rather than a statistician. The statisticians invented a language called S um, back in the 1970s. Interestingly, um, the guys who were uh, uh, creating this language were just down the corridor from uh, the team creating um, Unix, the um, forefather of Linux, if you like, um, at at t Bell Labs, uh, New Jersey. You can actually see, uh, and they, they also um, uh, plugged into some of the AI community at that time as well. You actually see some of the elements of AI and Unix in the design of R. But it was designed by statisticians, and as a computer scientist, I can see many deficiencies in the language itself. We love Python. Python's a really beautiful, clean language for doing a lot of our work. But the power of R is that almost any algorithm that I can imagine that I want to use for doing AI and machine learning is available in R, let alone the whole suite of statistical packages available there as well. There are something like, uh, well, there's over 10,000. We, we recently reached that mark. There are over 10,000. Um, <laughs> over 10,000. That's very gloomy, isn't it? There are over 10,000 packages contributed to um, the R ecosystem, um, available to anyone to download. Um, how many users do we have? Maybe 3 million. R is the re -implement, open source re-implementation of that language called S. Um, by uh, a couple of New Zealanders, in fact, um, in the 1990s. It grew from a small team of um, maybe uh, you know, a, a, a dozen users in the 1990s, um, um, being an Australian, close to New Zealand, um, um, knowing some of these people who were working on this, we started using it quite early on. Um, but it's grown to, to three million users, we guess, today. And it hasn't grown because a vendor is sitting there trying to sell it. It's grown because data scientists analyzing data have adopted it and taken it to their companies and said, we want to use this language to do our analyses of data. And it's grown organically because it's been so, um, so useful. Um, I introduced R and open source into the Australian government um, when I joined uh, the Australian Taxation Office 12 years ago to set up a data mining and analytics capability. It took me three years to set up the infrastructure for our data science team. Three years of um, a lot of extra, a lot of hard argument against um, a lot of the commercial interests from a lot of the vendors around the place who were fighting tooth and nail against open source software. They saw it as a threat. How times have changed so dramatically today. The, the vendors are embracing open source software so enthusiastically and really see that their future has to um, depend on um, or include an embracement of open source software. I, I really find this figure fascinating as a computer scientist. Um, R is a specialised language. It's not a general purpose language as such, like C, um, Sepa, Java, Python, etc. It's a very specific language. According to IEEE Spectrum's language popularity, and they use something like 15, I think, different metrics to decide on the popularity of languages, R is the fifth most popular programming language out there. That's massive given that it's, it is a specialised language rather than a general purpose language. Um, 
It's not as popular, of course, as Python, but Python is a language of the internet and a general purpose language. More popular than C Sharp, PHP, JavaScript, and so on. When I was setting up the data science team, one of the problems I had, though, was how do we get people who might know databases to interact and start using some of these algorithms in this language called R? And I wanted to get more of a community of users. And having to tell people I had 150 um, data, si um, data analysts across the organisation, part of my role was to bring them up to speed with data science, data mining. Um, they had no interest in going to coding, um, writing programs in, in R. R did not have a, um, a graphical user interface. Um, so I had a challenge and we, we brought together a package called Rattle to help us do that. So Rattle is a package, um, uh, you can get a bit of a glimpse of it there, but a package for um, providing a very simple, trivial, not a very well polished, but a rough and ready um, graphical user interface to building, uh, building your models. Um, after you've installed uh, R on your system, and if you're on uh, Ubuntu, um, it's as easy as WAG install um, R recommended, if I've spelled that right. Um, that be on the end recommended, probably. Um, if you do that, that will go through and install all the packages that you need to run R. You can then install the Rattle package um, with a Margig install R cran rattle. Um, I've probably already got it installed. I won't do that just here. Um, but that will then install rattle. You then start up R. I'm a bit of um, an ancient uh, user of um, um, command line and uh, Emacs. Um, so I'll just use that. If you're starting with R today, then R Studio is the recommended um, um, IDE. Um, really, really nicely done. Borrowed a lot from the Emacs uh, ecosystem, um, uh, but done so much more as well. So I'm gonna load in the Rattle library, and I'm going to start up Rattle. Now, that's very small, apologies for that. It's even smaller than it usually is, but um, never mind. I'll hopefully you can see the key elements there. Um, a claim to fame is within four steps you can build four clicks of the mouse button. You can build your first machine learning model, and to do that, you just click on execute. There's a sample data set in there. It was appropriate. We were talking about weather in the previous presentation. Um, that's getting today's weather. There's a sample data set of observations of weather that have been collected over the past, um, the past 10, 12 years now. This sample is just a very small subset of that. It's just um, one year of observations. But we can load in the sample data set. There's the second click. I go to the model tab, I click on execute, four clicks, and I've got my first decision tree model. Now, you can see that blurry bit of text there. That's the actual model. I'll click on draw and we get a better uh, presentation of the model. So you can see the model that um, um, it's taking historic data, just like we were talking about here, predicting whether you're wearing glasses or not. And it's, it's looked at uh, pressure 3 p.m. as the first variable. Um, and if it's less than, if it's greater than or equal to 1012 hectopascal, um, um, whatever the measure is. Um, then we look at the amount of cl uh, cloud cover at 3 p.m. If that's less than 7.5, then we predict that tomorrow it's not going to rain with 95% accuracy. Um, the, on the right-hand side, we're going to predict with 75 or 74% accuracy that it is going to rain tomorrow. Very simple model using exactly that algorithm that we kind of got a feel for earlier, um, and extensively used through um, industry today. Decision tree induction. That's building one tree. Um, random forest here. Click on forest, click on that. That's just built 500 of those trees um, in 0.33 seconds. 
very efficient algorithm, uh, does it quickly. 500 of those trees, all using different variables for, um, for partitioning and predicting uh, whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. Those models turn out to be much more accurate than just a single point model. Um, and there's many reasons why that might be the case. So that's um, decision tree algorithm, a bit of a sense of what machine learning does. And R as a open source toolkit for accessing algorithms. Algorithms written in a variety of languages, many of these are implemented in C. This random forest algorithm, the author of that, um, uh, uh, Leo Riemann, um, who's passed away. That was originally written in Fortran, and that's the original version that's still in the package today. Works works well. Um, but C++, C Sharp, uh, other uh, um, languages can all be integrated in here. And I use the one interface to access all of those um, uh, algorithms. One issue with R is that everything is done in memory. And that's a major problem. Uh, if we go back to here, um, it's if it fits in memory, great. If it doesn't, we've got some issues. Um, that's what the work of Microsoft R has been looking at. How do we extend R to work out of memory into disk and um, remove that um, uh, limit? So my um, R and indeed Rattle is being extended um, and if you go to, um, it's actually on Bitbucket rather than GitHub, but from Bitbucket you'll find the latest version of Rattle which handles out of memory data sets um, of any size and it has those algorithms implemented in parallel. One minute just to finish. Um, the other issue is how do we scale up to do big data um, when I do most of my work on my laptop here in R. Um, my laptop's got, I don't know, actually four, six gigs of RAM, I think, um, and it might have two, maybe four cores in here. Um, today, today in the world, it, it, it's, the, it's the era of the cloud, and that is so powerful. Um, I mentioned that it took me three years to bring um, a open source stack into the into one government department in Australia, and I repeated that for a number of government departments in Australia. Um, three years to to get that set up in working with the um, IT department and so on. Today, in five minutes, I can push a button, and within five minutes, um, I can start up a new data science um, virtual machine. Um, if you were here for Ben's presentation an hour ago, he mentioned the Windows Data Science Virtual Machine. I'd highlight that we have a Linux Data Science Virtual Machine, completely open stack, uh, open source stack um, from the base up. It's, it's running on CentOS. Um, and it installs a collection of the best machine learning algorithms we have available today. And our goal is to make the very best available to anyone who starts up this machine, irrespective of where those algorithms come from. We have CNTK, which is Microsoft's version of deep learning there. We have TensorFlow, which is Google's version of deep learning there. We have, um, uh, M, um, what's the, XGBoost, no, um, NXNet, which is, in a sense, Amazon's, I think, chosen version of um, uh, deep learning algorithm there. So we have a suite of the algorithms out of the box, five minutes to set it up, and it's elastic. So now, from my laptop here, I can run um, uh, a bit of code in R, uh, which will um, essentially, uh, not essentially, it will um, fire up a virtual machine for me. So I'm just very quickly going through this without really explaining. I'm creating a random name and a resource group and a location being Southeast Asia, which is here in Singapore. I'm connecting to that um, data center at the moment. And once that's finished, I'll create what's called a resource group. Once that resource group is there, and if it takes too long, I'll blame the network, there we go. 
I've now sent off a request to create a resource group and that resource group has been created and I'll now fire this off. That's now starting up a data science virtual machine. It's creating a new instance for me in the cloud and it takes a bit of time, it takes five minutes. Um, you can see it um, is, is running down the bottom there. I think we're on in a uh, little bit of slow network, but it's communicating with that data center and it's getting responses back, checking the progress of the standing up of that data science virtual machine. Once that's there, again from R, with some packages that um, with my colleague here with, uh, we're developing, we can use R to control and run jobs on those servers. And we can resize those servers as need. So that I start off with a cheap $20 a month um, server, scale it up to a $1,000 a month server um, when I need it, and only when I need it, and turn it back off or scale it back down when I don't need that amount of compute power. So it's becoming very cost effective, very efficient, and a great way for, for us to do our data science these days. As I say, that's going to take another, um, another few minutes to, to connect there. Once that's fired up, you could use X to go, for example, to connect across to it. And I think I lost my connection uh, at some stage. But you then have a GUI interface, and I could then interact with Rattle, for example, in exactly the same way as on my desktop, run my processes there. And I have, when I need it, a powerful machine. A couple of resources to refer to, but um, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for the questions, but I understand you'll be around later on if you want to approach.